afternoon to every all of you now yesterday i was uh, speaking to you about uh, the basics of ceramic analysis that is the traditional methods and how ceramics can act as a source of information for archaeologists then i also spoke about the traditional ceramic making and how do we do the categorization and classification part the third one that i left it the characterization part i said that i will do it later so this particular lecture is primarily to demonstrate how characterization of ceramics can be done using a variety of techniques like i use microscopic methods i have a polarizing microscope and i use that i also had an atomic absorption spectrophotometer earlier now it doesn't work and i did some chemical analysis of ceramics and uh, i used to do uh, based on the chemical composition i used to work now what i have been doing as a characterization is that either using mineralogical composition or chemical composition i was trying to identify certain groups and with the help of that group i was trying to say this is the provenance or the genesis of the material the provenance of the material and once you know the provenance of the material you see from which context archaeological context from which site from which region these ceramics have come so then you try to explain what was the mechanism of movement of the ceramics uh one of the works that i did was about the roman ceramics there is something there is a, a ceramic type called rouletted ware about its provenance there has been lot of debate i just uh, removed that uh, presentation part from this because it was taking too much time but i will towards the end i will explain a little bit so now i am going to demonstrate different case studies and uh, how these scientific methods are used in archaeology and then once it is used in archaeology how can you make interpretations that are supporting the cultural issues i don't know if you are able to read this one from a distance probably you can read it that is yesterday when i was telling you about the different stages of ceramic manufacture i said that there are different stages that is from collection to preparation and uh, shaping of the vessels then drying it and applying different types of uh, slip or wash or giving different types of surface treatments and baking so these are all the ones that are given in the left hand side and the methods adopted to study that such as microscopic methods like thin section analysis that is using a polarizing microscope you do it x-ray diffraction and then chemical analysis then that is for collection of clay for the preparation of the clay clay paste you have uh, macroscopic studies that is looking at the material uh, using your naked eye itself you can try to say whether it is coarse fine medium the textural part that is what you are trying to understand then you use lot of microscopic methods then for shaping macroscopic methods that is you look at the striation marks which are found there is a general belief that if a pot is made on a wheel the potter holds it straight and this will give it a parallel striation mark which is not necessarily correct always because yesterday i showed you how ceramics are made using multiple techniques so there are there can be certain variations in that and uh, there are also microscopic method are also there because there are longitudinal particles which come within the clay and these longitudinal particles also tend to take an orientation which is parallel to each other then surface treatments that is uh, microscopic examination then microscopic and also chemical analysis one part of my lecture i will cover that then baking how does one determine the baking temperature and what kind of uh, archaeological interpretations can be made by understanding the baking temperature is it significant to understand the baking temperature that is it so we will come to all these things and now if you look at the indian archaeological scenario 
uh, science-based analysis is not a new thing in Indian archaeology. If you look at this chart, wet chemical analysis was used by Hamid. It was published in 1931, that is ceramic from Mohanjagaro. And then Sana Ullah, then Dr. D. Lal, and this Krishnan appearing, that is me. Okay. So there has been several kind of uh, analysis that has been taking place, wet chemical analysis. Now, if you go through their studies, they may not be giving any kind of concrete suggestions and all. But it does tell you or it does demonstrate the scope of this kind of analysis. That is one thing. These materials can be analyzed. That is one. Second thing, if you look at the chemical compositions and all those things, you see some kind of variations. Certain mineral elements are present, certain elements are absent. This presence and absence of these elements, they are probably indicative of the sources of the raw material. So we are directly hitting at the raw material. That is, uh, with the help of wet chemical analysis they have been doing. And microscopic studies, Plunderlith, he did the microscopic study on a particular kind of uh, uh, ceramic called reserve slip ware, and to establish which one is a lower slip and which one is a upper slip. Then also, Two people called Venkata Chalapati and Ramaswamy, they have done a lot of pin section analysis of ceramics from southern India. They are dating back to early historic and medieval period ceramics. Of course, they have not concluded anything, but they tried this method. And then neutron activation analysis has been done. Uh, and it also demonstrated that how groups can be identified from trace element data and then comparisons can be made, especially when you are trying to establish the provenance of ceramics. And there are certain necessary, there are certain, uh, you know, there are certain demands that provenance of the ceramics need to be understood to, to come out with certain kind of supporting statements with regard to trade and all kinds of things. Uh, for instance, uh, this roulette ware is a kind of ceramic that you come across between 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD. And this technology developed in the Hellenistic world in 4th century BC. And it came to India as a result of Indian Ocean trade. And one of those senior archaeologists, Mortimer Wheeler, when he was excavating Arikamedu, that site, he noticed this one. And he noticed two different types of roulette ware. One of a very superior quality and one inferior quality. And he was almost sure that the superior quality of roulette ware had come from the Hellenistic world because it had all finished and everything. But the inferior quality, he thought that it was local artists, artists, they were trying to imitate it. And it is, of course, people reacted to it in a very different way, but I reacted to it in a very positive way because imitation is a major cultural process. And you cannot, you know, you can imitate a shape, you can imitate a form, but imitating the technology without having an analytical data or without having some orientation from the actual actual craftsman who made it, it is a very difficult. So there is a lot of experimental stages and probably it is still not done, that work is not still complete. In South India, if you work, if any of you are interested in doing some kind of ceramic analysis in Southern India, you might come across this kind of experimental stages and you will be able to say that how it developed the indigenously how they developed this technology from the you know by imitate uh, imitating technology how they developed it within the uh, early historic context so for that there was it was necessary when the, i have done a lot of work on this related work to try to establish the provenance and i have found that the samples which i analyzed they had three different sources. One source was in Sri Lanka, one was in India, and one was in Petra in Jordan region. Now, a study of Harappan ceramics. Uh, most of the analysis of the Harappan ceramics is, uh, I was the one who initiated this kind of studies in petrographic studies in Harappan ceramics. I used methods like pin section analysis, X-ray diffraction, then scanning electron microscopy, energy dispersive X-ray analysis, differential thermal analysis, thermogrammetric analysis, 
all kinds of methods I have used. And I was trained in these methods by several people, like the way that you train students here. I was also trained for um, EDX and SCM. I was trained in Sardar Patel University and also IIT Bombay. And then further I got training in SCM in Oxford and many other universities where I visited. Uh, differential thermal analysis and thermogrammetric analysis. I was trained again in IIT Mumbai by Professor Chakravarti. Professor Dilip Chakravarti, DK Chakravarti, he was there at that time. In the 80s, I got an opportunity to work there. So, uh, I have used all these methods and then uh, these methods were used to understand one was the provenance of the raw material and the production techniques. And the second one was to understand the composition and the microstructure of the pigments and the slips, which is a very complicated kind of thing because you have uh, a red slip over which you have a black pigment and when you analyze it, you get the composition more or less the same, that is it. Then along with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Herman, Frank Herman, his name is Charles Frank Herman and uh, he worked in Rogery for several years. So he used to come to MS University and we together worked with a type of ceramics called Michael Shredder. And we noticed that there is a lot of difference between Michael Shredder and the Harappan ceramics in terms of microstructure and uh, which itself was very uh, significant because we found that the Harappan ceramics were following an industrial pattern whereas the Michael Shredder was a handicraft kind of industry. So, based, so there were different types of industries existing in, during the Indus Valley period in Gujarat that uh, we were able to say from the microstructural analysis, that is the thin section studies. Then another student of mine, uh, she did her PhD from Pune, uh, but uh, she did work with me on petrography and over almost a year she was there. She worked with this uh, Padri Ware ceramics, which is supposed to be non harappan and the type site is Padri, which is in Bhavnagar district. And also Kajal Shah, who was my student, now she is in, uh, she is one of the very good petrographers, I should say. And she did work with the black and red ceramics. So that is all about the Harappan ceramics and then history of scientific analysis leading with Deccan child quality. Dr. Gokte, he had done analysis of Jorvi and Malwa ways. Primarily, he looked at the firing conditions and uh, he was able to say which one is a better condition because that better firing condition is very significant for an archaeologist because you know you see a development in pyrotechnology and you see a development in creating infrastructure facilities etc etc then there is something called northern black polished ware this is a very strange kind of term it was obtained from the northern india when it was first found in northern india and it was black in color, it had a polish, so they call it as northern black polish. But if you look at its distribution, you see it from uh, Kabul to uh, east, uh, somewhere in uh, uh, Cambodia you get it. And you get it even in Sri Lanka. So it is neither northern and it is not black also because you have, black is one of those colors. You have golden color, you have silver color, you have violet color, uh, you have a very, you know, different shades of it and I have completed my analysis on that and that article will be published soon. I'm not presenting that work here, nor NBPW, I have completed the analysis of it. Uh, uh, these are all, see, the, when you look at the charcoality cultures, charcoality cultures means the copper using cultures, you have different types of charcoality cultures in India. Uh, Indus civilization is also a charcoalty culture, but then it has certain other kind of cultural traits which are not present in the regional charcoalty culture. Its distribution is much bigger, whereas the regional charcoalty culture, their distribution is at a very smaller end. So you have Kaitha culture, then Ahar culture, okay? And then you have the Central Indian, uh, that is Deccan charcoalty cultures, of which you have Malwa and uh, Jorve. Then there is Savalda, that is another one. So you have, see, during that uh, 
third uh, millennium BC, I should say, towards the end of the third millennium BC and the initial stages of the second millennium BC. If you take a time period between 2500 BC to something around 1500 BC, there has been a lot of village settlements developing different parts of India. And this, they, they are, you know, they have been, uh, come, you know, we are trying to say that this is Ahar based on a type site and its limits are determined by seeing the similarities in the artifact typology and also by looking at the similarities in the subsistence pattern and similarities in the architecture. So almost all parameters, we try to see their similarities and we say that, okay, this is very much close to the type of settlements that you see in Ahar. So it can come within the Ahar child quality. Similarly is this, uh, uh, you know, Jorve and Malwa, because these are all specific kind of pottery traditions that emerge within this cultural context. And they have its own identity. They don't, they are not similar. They look different. Their uh, surface features are different. The kind of designs that are there are different. So they have a separate identity. That is it. So at which places we have encountered those Jorve? Navadatoli, Maheshwar, these are all the places where you get. That is on the Narmada River. And uh, Dr. Krishnan, if I may ask one question. We often read that the precise manufacturing process of northern black polished ware in the Gangetic Plains is not properly understood and has not been replicated. Do you agree with this statement? And finally, what is it that makes this black polish, in your opinion? It is unpublished. Unpublished. Unpublished? <laughs> yeah. It's can not yet published. Hercinite, that is what. Can you give us a sneak preview? Hercinite. That is a compound we have been able to identify. Hercinite. Oh. Okay. And the, I, huh? and the manufacturing process? Manufacturing process, we are making a conjectural reconstruction, but uh, that is based on our present day knowledge. Now, there is a difficulty in my whole, uh, this particular, when if you ask me about the glazing part, that uh, Polish part, they are using several organic material because they crush leaves and there are many of the things and those things do not leave any mark. We are not able to, we can only get the inorganic composition. The composition of the organic materials we are not able to get. So as a result of which we have certain problems, but we also have uh, variations within the color. That is, there is a uh, silver tinge, there is a pinkish tinge, there is a golden tinge that you see it. So what, uh, while making this particular slide, what I want to say is that it is neither northern nor black. It is a fine deluxe kind of thing because that uh, terminology itself needs to be revised now. Then uh, there has been a lot of work. Actually, my own supervisor, Professor KTM Hegde, he did some work on ceramic, this uh, northern black Polish ware. And he said that the color is due to magnetite. Maybe true, I'm not saying. Because there must have been several types of color. Because it's spread, if you see, is a very vast geography. So within that, there cannot be, you know, they may have used different types of material. That is why you have these different colors coming in that one. And the most interesting thing is that Professor Egde, while he was working, he tried to support one of those statements that was proposed by archaeologists saying that painted gray ware, black slipped ware and northern black polished ware. There is a successive stage of development in technology which they were looking at it in a microscopically. He could support it. He said that it is more or less correct. There is a gradual development which I do not believe it today because I have been working in Nepal for the last uh, four or five years and I have been studying the ceramics from Lumbini and also I have been studying the ceramics from Tilara Court. So I have come across a ceramic type called Proto NBPW. It's a proto form of NBPW. This was first uh, diagnosed by a person called uh, Varadi, Professor Varadi. He's an Italian. And he, while excavating in, in a place called uh, Tilara Court, he came across this spe special kind of uh, ceramic and it created a lot of uh, debates in Indian archaeology. Uh, some of the people said that you should not have a new kind of uh, type and all. But then 
when that comes in, painted grey ware, black slipped ware, we don't need to place it in between because these things you see contemporary to each other. And so it is not correct to have a kind of uh, this kind of linear scale of development of things. But PGW, of course, you don't find, uh, you know, in the initial stages of PGW, you do not find northern black polished ware or anything of that sort because it starts coming from around 1300 BC onwards. So this graded development and all kinds of things is some, some today it is reputable. Then Dr. D. Lal and Bharat Dwaj, and they said that uh, it is due to elemental carbon. And the reason, because once you heat it, it turns red. That is something which is happening. The majority of the uh, northern black Polish were what you see in Ganga Valley, especially in the places like uh, that uh, Bihar, UP border, the dark ones. If you heat it, it uh, disappears. It uh, turns red. So maybe it is because carbon goes up. That is what they thought. Then uh, Professor Gokte was more, uh, you know, diplomatic in this one. He said that it is a compound effect of all kinds of these things because he probably analyzed uh, samples from different regions, which were produced to give the same kind of appearance, but maybe used to use, using different techniques. That is also possible. You can produce the same stuff using different kinds of techniques because these communities, these potters community, they can produce, reproduce certain things using different techniques also. So, Professor Gokte, when he analyzed, he made this statement. It's very, it looks very interesting. Probably he found evidence for all these techniques, you know, all these representations in his studies. And Robert Harding, he has just summarized these things, the studies on this. So this is another set of uh, scientific analysis that has been done in Indian context. Then I'm coming to this uh, rule that where Ardika, an Australian, he did some neutron activation analysis to determine the provenance. And Professor Gokte did it. And no, none of us have been able to determine the provenance. Actually, uh, there is an agreement between the analysis of uh, mine and Professor Gokte's, that is, there is Ganga Valley we have been identifying as one of the prom promising region because I got some materials from Ganga Valley. But I also have uh, had some samples from Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka also is a provenance. Then Petra in Jordan, they are also my Nirwadi was matching. So I had three sets and the three regions were there. Whereas Professor Gokte's samples were mostly from Ganga Valley and he was getting the uh, signatures of the clay from Ganga Valley. And uh, Ardika also had uh, most of the samples from Ganga Valley. And then he also had some samples that is coming from some other place. And this uh, 2004, that is Louise Ford, she was my own PhD student. So she did ICPAS, that is inductively coupled plasma uh, absorption and emission spectroscopy and mass spectroscopy and she did it and uh, she got some kind of uh, very interesting kind of results. Now I'm getting into a term called fabric. If you read archaeological literature, you will come across this term fabric and where it is very inconsistently defined. But when you are trying to look at the microstructure, that is when you are trying to do the thin section analysis, the term fabric is defined like this. It Primarily, it looks at the overall composition, uh, mineralogy, and texture. What I am coming to is that I will just, uh, before I get into that part, let me just show you this one. This is the microscope which I use. It's a polarizing microscope. And the person sitting here, he worked in IIT for about three years. He left some last year, we know. And this is the stage of the microscope, which is a stepping stage. It's a point counter. So IIT, here we have you have a, a much better advanced one. This one is 30 years old. I bought it when I got my first project. Now I'm about to retire, so still I'm using it because I know, I, but I learned to, you know, even um, uh, dismantle it, assemble it, so I do the servicing and everything. University doesn't give me any grant. So I have my own ways of uh, doing this uh, servicing of this microscope. But then it has been giving a lot of uh, good results. So when I look at the thin sections under this microscope, I come across this fabric definition. You know, this is the fabric that I am seeing there. 
So when I say fabric, it represents an overall composition. And it includes mineralogy, texture, nature of the voids, then frequency of the inclusions, degree of sorting, orientation of particles, these are all the things. You now what I want to tell you is that when I say these things, there are, when you look at the thin section, there are two things that you are looking. One is a matrix. That is the clay part which has undergone certain changes and then the non-plastic material. So the plastic material and the non-plastic material. Within the non-plastic material, you have mineral phases as well as non-mineral phases. In the mineral phases, you have uh, different minerals, rock fragments, uh, and uh, yeah, these are all the two things coming. The non-mineral phases means crushed pottery, which we call it as grog. Then you have also voids where certain organic materials are there. Now, when I am doing this study, I know that I will not get, I will not be able to study the mineralogy of the clay because it has already undergone change. It has decomposed, it has undergone decomposition. So what I am doing is that I am looking at the mineralogy of the sand which is added to this clay. And then I am trying to understand the provenance of the sand and assuming that this is a provenance of the ceramic or it is somewhere nearby area, it is coming. Then this is, to begin with it is like this. Then we make other kind of analysis and make some kind of uh, confirmation because you do two or three types of different analysis. I have, I generally do microscopy and uh, X-ray diffraction and SEM EDX. These are all the analysis that I do. And I make a combination of that. Yeah, he, he was asking something. Of inclusion? Yeah, I'll come to that. Actually, I still have not completed the slide. So, I just told you the basic part of it. Now, the mineralogy. How do we determine the mineralogy? What we do is that we look at the optical properties of these minerals. Primarily, it is mostly dominated by feldspar and quartz. When you look at the Gujarat material, it is feldspar and quartz. Especially when you are looking at materials from that is coming from the central Gujarat alluvial plain. It has a mixed fed nature of geology because the materials that are coming from the Saurashtra area, which is a ductant trap material, which contain high amount of augite and feldspar. Then from the Aravalli hills, there is a lot of material coming, which has quartz, mica and all. Then on the eastern side, you have acid and basic intrusives. So those rocks also undergo weathering and they bring out their kind of minerals and all kinds of these things are. So when we do, the, it look, comes mineralogy. That is mineralogy means you look at the um, optical properties of each grain and try to identify what mineral it is, whether it is quartz. If so, how many quartz is there? If it is mica, if so, how many mica is there? That is the first part. Second is texture. And this term texture is defined with by using three parameters. One is grain shape, the other one is grain size, then the frequency. When you say grain shape, there is angular grains are there. Angular grains means when you take a grain, its corners will be very sharp. And once it travels a little distance, you know, the corners will get worn out. That is known as subangular. Then it becomes subrounded, then rounded. So that is a grain shape. Now then you have grain size, that is based on the size of the grain, you categorize them into sand and silt. And within the sand and silt, you have further classifications. For instance, clay is less than, that is sedimentological definition, clay is a siliceous particle whose size is less than 2 microns. 2 to 60 microns range if you take, that is known as silt. Then 60 microns to 100 microns, you call it as very fine sand. 100 microns to 200 microns, you call it as fine sand. 200 microns to 500 microns, you call it as medium sand. 500 to 1000 
microns, you call it as very coarse sand. Then 1000 to 2000, you call it as gravel. Then you have pebble, you have cobalt, you have, uh, it goes on, goes, and it goes until mountain. It can go up because huge rock for it's primarily a size definition. So you look at the grain size like that. So grain shape, grain size. Then comes the frequency. Which one is the dominant mineral? Whether it is quartz or whether it is feldspar or whether it is mica. So the dominant mineral we try to see and what is the percentage of it within a particular given area. It's very important. You look at the field of view and see what is the percentage of the grain. That is the frequency of inclusion. Then degree of sorting. That is, we have different types of you know, terms used for uh, referring to the degree of sorting. That is, poorly sorted, ill sorted, then moderately sorted, well sorted, perfectly sorted. If you look at a deposit and if the grains, 90% of the grains have more or less the same size, you say that it is perfectly sorted. Somewhere around 70, you say that it is well sorted. Is 50 50, you say that moderately sorted. When it comes to around 20, you say that it is poorly sorted. Then further down, 10% agreement, 90% disagreement, you say that it is ill sorted. So, and this is something which is very important because this happens in nature as well as it happens in the workshop. So, the potter also does a lot of modification in the clay. So, what you are seeing is a combination of a natural as well as a cultural activity. You have to be very clever there. You have to, to draw that line between the natural thing and the cultural thing. It's very difficult. I had to uh, do ethnographic surveys and studies for almost five years to understand that particular line. Then orientation of particles, I said that uh, when if you have linear particles, they might tend to orient parallelly when they are, you know, thrown on the beam. And is it clear for you? Yes, sir. No? So these are all the three stages of fabric characterization. What you do is that you look at the clay matrix, that is the ground mass, and its color, optical state, uh, compactness, birefringence. These are all certain technical terms, and uh, it's uh, primarily you know optical microscopy. Those people who do optical microscopy, they try to understand that uh, color. It can you know there is something called Michael Levy chart. First order color, second order color, third order color. So you try to match it with that. <coughs> and uh, like that it has. Then non plastic inclusion, their mineralogy and texture, which I said. Then non mineral phases, voids. And also, recent of, uh, recently, because as I, I've been doing it for several years, I have uh, started identifying a lot of biological material in this one. White toilets, that is something which I've been, I've started seeing it. But I cannot. Uh, count it because uh, as per the in a methodology uh, when whenever I am doing thin section analysis uh, I cannot consider those grains whose size is less than 20 microns because the thickness of the thin section is between 20 to 30 micron and if you are taking below it uh, you may not be able to see the optical properties properly. So your identification may not be purple. So generally, I avoid it. But I know if they are silica skeletons. That is what I am meaning by non-mineral phases. This is how one, one of the sections looking like. So here, what you have is that this brownish part that you are seeing, these are all the matrix part, OK? And here it is brownish color. This is reddish color. And You have uh, angular grains, and you can see there are different types of colors. And these are all the voids, probably. And here also you can see. So this is one of the uh, sections. And here you can see this is 100 micron. Here is this also 100 micron. So it's a small area that has been magnified. And uh, another one. You can see there is definitely a variation. You can see if you look at this one, uh, overall appearance of this and overall appearance of this, they are different. 
So what a petrographer does is that this overall difference is expressed in terms of mineralogy, in terms of its uh, optical properties. So there you are able to draw a line between these two. And they fall in different categories, different families actually. Same is the case here. This is a very coarse material and you can see a large amount of calcium carbonate. And this one, its shape itself is different and this is a bioclast. This is a shell that has undergone fossilization and it had become a part of the alluvium and from the clay was, raw material was exploited from the alluvium, it got into it and by accident it got into it. And this is a basalt rock piece. So, many other things, you should also see what exactly, sorry, is written here. These are all the kinds of things that you can uh, bring out, you know, from it. And then what we generally do is that uh, you try to make them into groups, like uh, A, B, C, D. These are all the parent groups. There is a distinct mineralogical variation between the samples that you get in group A, group B, and group C. And, but at the same time, there are certain subgroups that I am giving, A1, A2, A3. These subgroups, the mineralogical similarity is there, but texturally there is a difference. Some of them are very coarse, some of them are very fine. So it indicates a different kind of manufacturing process. So that is why they are categorized as subgroups. And uh, here you can see how they look like uh, different types of, uh, this is the grain size plotted here. This one I have already explained. Uh, then interpreting, what do you do? That is when you relate, there are different ways of looking at the uh, fabric groups. Uh, there is one work that I had done in Sri Lanka, a place called Anirathapura. That is a settlement, a major Buddhist uh, settlement. It began as a village somewhere in 1000 BC and it was uh, attacked by the Cholas. Rajaraja Chola attacked it and it came to an end somewhere around 11th century already. Almost 2000 years that settlement. So it started as a small Iron Age village and became the capital of Sri Lanka, then it collapsed. So there was an excavation and 10 meter trench, 10 by 10 by 10, that was a trench. So 10 meter, we had several layers and from each layer, different contexts, we collected samples and tried to scan through it, that uh, all kinds of, you know, uh, the mineralogical and the textile analysis, everything was done. And we could see how technological progression was taking place from the lowermost level to the uppermost level through uh, looking at the uh, thin section analysis. That is one thing. Second thing is that we need also need to see whether archaeological classification of ceramics and this characterization, is there any kind of link between these things? That is the second thing that I am trying to say here. This is, the, uh, this is one, the stratigraphic distribution that I said. Then also functional difference, like for example, if you look at the cooking vessels, you will find a domination of plagioclase feldspar, calcite. These are all the minerals that you generally find in cooking vessels. It may have started as an accident, I don't know. But the interesting part is that the coefficient of expansion of clay and the coefficient expansion of these minerals are very close to each other. So when the cooking vessels are continuously heated, three or four times or five times, it is getting heated. It doesn't undergo any kind of shear or stress and it does not break. It gets a long durability because these kind of minerals are used. Calcite is also one of them. I do not know if it is just an accident, but whenever you analyze cooking vessels from Gujarat or anywhere, you find the domination of these, that is, plagioclase feldspar, calcite, basalt rock pieces, something of that sort, whose or minerals whose coefficient of expansion is very close to that of the coefficient of expansion of clay. 
that is one of the things and then second thing is a larger vessel you may have larger grains in that one so now you have to explain the ceramic microstructure these are all the uh, kind of things that is uh, chosen that is these are all the parameters that we choose to study it and i told you that i had lot of difficulties in understanding the ceramics for five years i worked with potters and collected materials from them and this is a black clay and this is a, a red clay and they were mixed and they were prepared to this one and the base of the vessel and the rim portion now this kind of exercise was done to understand how the working in of a porter gets translated into a microstructure so i did uh, work in chota udaipur there are about uh, four or five workshop complexes there then i did some work in north gujarat then i did some work in haryana i did some work in southern part of india i did some work in sri lanka and all different places so collected these samples and prepared uh, collected samples from each stage and looked at the thin sections and try to see how this processing got translated into this so this was very much essential because you had to calibrate the methodology because in india we nobody had done this kind of work so i had to do this kind of calibration work and uh, then finally it was i was able to understand what exactly it is second thing is that whenever you are trying to do ceramic analysis you take a piece of pottery and you assume that this particular pottery is representing a potter's workshop or a workshop complex or a culture or a civilization that is how your basis of analysis then when you are taking a thin section there also you need to have an assumption that the composition of that particular pottery that you are getting it is a composition which is traveling through all these stages of a raw material that is coming from one workshop or a raw material that is used in different workshop complexes or a raw material that has been exploited by a village or a community or a cultural group something like that it keeps on going so i had to see how far there is an agreement so the base portion of the vessel and the rim portion of the vessel they were sampled and that i try to see it you may see some difference in the appearance but mineralogically and texturally when you convert it into numbers and even you see it in the terms of values it remain it becomes say now i am getting this is primarily a methodology that i had adopted by using thin section analysis now i am getting into a case study this is the much celebrated site of harappa i had an opportunity to go to pakistan in 2012 i visited harappa mohenjodaro takshila many people are jealous of me because of that and even lahore anarkali bazar and all those most of these uh, historically significant places so there is a problem when we are trying to analyze indian ceramics especially that of the harappans they are quite fine so a photographer from the western countries they find it very difficult because they have been doing coarse ways most of them have been doing coarse ways and the early historic ceramics and all kinds of ceramics they are much much coarser than the harappan ceramics whereas harappans had perfected in their technology and they were able to come out with beautiful kind of uh, ceramics using fine ware so the difficulty is that the difficulty is in the methodology because majority of the grains their sizes range between 30 to something around 60 microns 30 to 100 microns which becomes very difficult for a person unless he is trained only in looking at that size of the grains uh, to identify the mineralogy and all those things so that is how i was chosen for this not because my photographic skills were high because i knew only this one how to do fine ware analysis because i have been doing fine ware so this was the excavation was conducted by mark enoyer the samples were collected by him only and uh, it was formerly it was excavated by wheeler also then prior to that it was excavated by watts and all those group and they had uh, in terms of its chronology they were saying many many things but mark enoyer brought out a different type of chronology 
the first phase, the earliest phase, he called it as Ravi phase. Somewhere you will find, in some literature you will find, it is equivalent to pre-Harappan. Then Cordigian, some places you will find it as early Harappan. Then the classical Harappan, then late Harappan. So these are all the period. Late Harappan also you might see it as symmetry edge culture. So you have this kind of periodization that is done. I was trying to study what are all the kinds of uh, uh, microstructural variations that can be understood from this particular site, since it is giving a very interesting kind of cultural sequence. And this is a sequence, actually, what you have it is at. So you may have to start from the base. You have a regionalization era where this uh, Ravi phase is falling between 3700 BC to 2800 BC. And you have the Cordigian one, 2800 to 2600 BC. Then you have the integration era, 2600 to 1900 BC. Within that, there are different stages of development that is Harappan period 3A, 3B, 3C. That A, B, C indicates either expansion of the settlement or certain new trades coming in or certain things going out, something of that sort. Then you have the late Harappan phase, and then you have uh, that is a localization, that is symmetry, yes. So, and, uh, so it is ranging between 1900 to something around 1700, and uh, you have it uh, overall, you have it until around 1300. So this is the time frame. And I had picked up certain samples, what he gave to me, I didn't do it. So he gave me those uh, samples selected by him in the form of a thin section, and I did it. No, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, let me, if I understood your question correctly, you are asking me about sequencing, okay? How do we do sequencing of a site? Let me explain it. One, that we depend on the structural phases. That is one thing. Second, we depend on the artifacts. That is, ceramics is one. Main thing is ceramic. So what, to begin with, what we do is that there are different structural phases. How do you differentiate the structural phase from, or a, stru a structure from one phase to another phase? Now there may be a difference in the building material. There may be a difference in the architecture. There may be a difference in the orientation. So that is what we are trying to look for. So you say that, okay, this is construction phase one. This is construction phase two. Then the kind of materials that have been, that have, that we collected from there, especially the ceramics, we try to take it out and we see from the lowermost layer to the uppermost layer, is there any change in its quality? Is there any change in its shape? Is there any change in its surface? So by looking at that, then you look at the other material, the kind of artifacts. Are, do we have stone blades here? Or do we have copper material here? Or do we have copper appearing in a stage that is somewhere in between? Or do we have something disappearing? So all these things are taken into consideration while you are doing the sequencing. So here, to begin with, to, 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 let me tell you, the, the stages are one, two, three, four, and five. Okay? This is, this is one, two, three, four, and five. But within one, there are certain interesting kind of two different types of things coming up, one above the other. So that is why it is Hakra. Hakra is a river name which is flowing through Chorisan Desert. So there is a type of ceramic called Hakra ceramic, which is also similar to that of uh, uh, Ravi ceramic. Because he is trying to 
establish that Arabi ceramic and Hakra ceramic are more or less the same kind of thing, slightly a coarser variety of material. So you have it. But then there are certain structural phases, variations in the structural phases there. Like for instance, uh, this is, um, this happened once, you see it like this. So here you can, this is, this is one of the areas, uh, it's not a very good photograph, but here you can see actually the, there is a structural phases, construction of structural phases and also orientation of the structures that may be varying in between. That is one. When, whereas when it comes to the Harappan period, 3A, 3B, 3C, and I'll tell you, Dolavira is a nearby site. If you look at the schematic diagram of that Dolavira stratigraphy, you can say that uh, there, is, there is also a 3A, 3B, 3C. What is happening is that after that, uh, during the stage, first stage, or in between the stage, there was a massive earthquake. So that collapsed certain areas. Now then they kept on adding the width of the wall, boundary wall. That is a change, major change taking place. So it has been put as 3B, stage B. So like that, so minor changes are taking place, but the cultural, overall nature of the culture does not undergo change. So that is why we have the subfaces. You got the answer for that? Happy? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Uh, so then, now you have, this is one of the, uh, the mounds in Harappa, and uh, what you can see is that um, the mud bricks, very interesting kind of mud bricks, then uh, polychrome pottery, and you also have these kind of designs on the ceramics, and this is some kind of uh, structure that they have cut, and also you can see there are bricks going in. Again, the same, I'm repeating the same thing, but then here I want to show the size. And then also, um, these are some of those close photographs. Again, you can see from the top view. Uh, here you can see this is one face, and the floor is here. But then you have those um, brick linings and all. So these are all the kinds of ceramics that uh, he is classifying it as Ravi pottery. Uh, it's not a new kind of ceramics because if you go through the literature, Harappan literature, you might come across this kind of ceramics. They have given it a different name, that is all. And he identifies it as the earliest type of ceramics at the site of Harappa. And this is how it uh, looks like. It's quite coarse and all kinds of things. Then uh, it's uh, decorations and all the kinds of things. Then again, the other kind of decorations that you see on it. Then different kinds of color combinations, polychrome and all. Then you also have uh, graffiti, which is a post firing. You can see those lines and all, which is also present there. And also pre-firing Porter's mark. Uh, somebody asked me this question yesterday that why I say it as a nail mark about this particular thing. And here there is a impression of the finger in this particular thing. Again, some of those uh, interesting kind of designs are horn daiji and all. Uh, again, the Kodiji period, that is, uh, you know, early Harappan period, that is how it is written in many texts and all. These are all the kinds of ceramics that you come across in that. And this is overall the type of Harappan pottery you have. Uh, this is the black strip jar. Uh, this is a black strip jar. And this is the estrophile jar. These are all storage jars. So, irrespective of the period, you have almost all the things that are. I just want to give you a feel of the Harappan ceramics. Then, this is when you go to the later Harappan period, that is symmetry edge. This is a kind of ceramics. You have these peculiar designs and all kinds of things. Now, the samples were given to me. Now, what do I need to do? What to, I need to, I had to de 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 um, develop a methodology. I had to work out a strategy to understand the ceramics. So, the paste textural features from Davi phase, I had to see from Davi to Kodiji to Harappan to Symmetry Edge, how it evolved. That is one thing. Work is halfway through, it's not fully complete. Then, 
second one was cooking vessels harappan cooking vessels it has a very strange kind of composition and its composition matches with that of gujarat its composition the composition of cooking vessels of harappan cooking vessel it is the same it matching is from gujarat to indus valley to oman region all the three places you get the same type of cooking vessel in form shape in terms of composition and this is a major challenge for archaeologists because i have been trying to understand how this has been happening actually because trading this small cooking vessels 4000 years ago from one continent part to another part of the continent through this sea is not an easy thing but then it also shows that lot of importance was attached to this kind of vessels does it mean that the kind of food that was eaten by communities in these three regions were more or less the same subsistence pattern was the same we don't know now so some of these are some of those issues and i was given something 170 thin section samples it was a little more than that but i could do only 170 because what happens is that if there are more grain fallouts and some section is eroded i won't be able to do it he gave me something around 190 20 were useless and they were characterized into different fabric groups based on its composition and i also worked out the subgroups based on the textural parameters grain size grain shape etc etc and then try to see what is the relation between this archaeological categorization of ceramics and that of the petrographic groups so here based on mineralogy uh, certain divisions are made a b c d e f g h these are all the main groups then you have subgroups a1 a2 b1 b2 c1 c2 then d1 d2 then e e1 e2 like that then f1 f2 there is also a f 203 121 now let me also tell you e and f is missing here because when i was doing this one i decided that one parameter uh, after going through all the sections i decided that okay this is the kind of method that i am going to use so in that one the samples which i analyzed i did not get a representation of the main group e and the main group uh, uh, f but i know that if i analyze more pottery from harappa i will they will get i will come across that so i had used certain specific categories a specific criteria for defining the groups like uh, uh, i'll explain this in the next one so here i can show you this is a uni model system group a is a uni model system and now if you go to uh, that the subgroup 1 it is a semi bimodal system and uh, subgroup 2 is bimodal now what is a semi bimodal bimodal this is a technological definition when you have when you look at the grain size pattern distribution pattern if you measure the grain size and if you have two dominant shape grains or two dominant size grains uh, two uh, do, uh, size grains dominating it is called as bimodal and only one size is dominating that is known as unimodal and one and half of another one is dominating that is known as semi bimodal uh, something like uh, this okay and this has a technological relation actually when you collect clay and refine it and when you make it most of the without addition or anything like that you either depending on the intensity of the preparation you get either unimodal or semi bimodal but only when you add sand extra sand into it you get bimodal so that is one thing which i learned from my ethnographic surveys and uh, doing this thin section analysis so the same uh, you know method was applied here that is why i did not have any kind of 
uh, main groups here, but I am sure that the mineralogically E, F, G, H, all these are different. So when I get a mineralogical group, some I will I am going to come across unimodal one, that will be put as E, and the semi bimodal one will be E one. There are some oppositions about that, but I know what uh, that is how it can be done. Uh, it's still not published, so we may change it because we have been trying to see if there is a regular group in that one in other pottery traditions. And now this is the thin section. This is 1000 micron. Uh, it's a globular jar of uh, ravi face. You can see the kind of, these are all dark patches. They are opaque materials. We have not been able to identify what exactly is the mineral. It looks like some kind of slag or something of that sort. But then we, we have to do some chemical analysis for that. This is again a globular jar. Uh, you can see overall it is dominated by feldspar grains. And then it is early herapen or that is a cordigian type vessel, globular jar. Then this is herapen dishon sand. Now you look at it. The way the grains are present and uh, Mineralogically, there may not be much difference. This one has entirely different. But the amount of grains which are present here, and the amount of grains that are present here, the amount of grains that are present here, or if you see the volume occupied by the grains and the clay, there is a variation. And this variation is suggesting several kinds of experimentation process by them. This is how, when you try to do it, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that is uh, primarily the mineralogical part and this is the textural part. So you can see um, semi-bimodal, bimodal, all kinds of things in this one. Then another set of uh, vessel that is, uh, this is a Harapan vessel, body shirt and uh, early Harapan globular jar. You see what exactly is the difference. Then Javi jar, then uh, this is a uh, early herapen, that is cordigian kind of. So there is some kind of relation, you can see. This is the first one, second one, then this. So there is a process of evolution in the clay paste preparation techniques. There is more consistency that is coming from experiment to a consistent development that you can see. This is the textural part and the, then the cooking vessel, the ravi period cooking vessel. And this is it. But uh, then early herapen globular jar and uh, bowl of the ravi face. Now you can see what exactly is the same period. There is some kind of uh, difference in the distribution of grains. The amount of grains is higher here. There is some, this is something to do with the function. Bowl is just a serving vessel. And if you heat this one, this will blow up with so many large number of uh, very, this much porosity and all kinds of things, it will, it will not be able to uh, survive. So, again, this is Harapan period jar, then early Harapan material, and early Harapan terracotta toy card. I just uh, picked it up to see if the technique is the same or not. Then Ravi period globular jar, and its uh, composition. Then here what I'm trying to give is an overall evolution part. So there is change taking place. We are trying to define it. And this is the Ravi face ceramics that is globular jar. Uh, the, there is another globular jar, then globular jar. So what you are seeing is that you are seeing within the face itself, there are a few varieties. And these varieties undergo evolution when it moves to another face which is quite significant because that is how the technological development is taking place and also exploitation of variety of raw materials is taking place because people are getting, you know, they are trying to understand the nature and all kinds of things in a very different way. Then this is early Harappan ceramics, where again the same thing. Um, then the Harappan ceramics. And this is a modern clay. So I did collect, collect some modern clay and try to compare it to it. So I can, without any hesitation, I can say the Harappan pottery which I analyzed from Harappa, that was made locally. 
because I have the same comp composition. But I am not going to say about other ones. You know, within Harappa itself, there may be different types of clay deposits having different composition, who knows. But at least I was able to uh, find out an area. We collected some clay from there. It was just one day visit. We collected some clay from there. And uh, that, by sheer luck, it happened to be uh, the same kind of thing. Uh, so that is a texture of that is a symmetry. Again, the same thing. Because what I'm trying to show you is that in the same period, we have different types of microstructures. And these microstructures, if you try to link it with the earlier pieces, you can see how it is developed, how it is evolving over a period of time. It's not published yet, so still we are working on it. And these are some of those uh, tentative conclusions that I had drawn from this ceramic analysis of uh, Harappa. Um, now, right, we are coming from Indus Valley to Gujarat region. So, this is another case study, provenance determination. Uh, I had done three sites from Gujarat. One a classical Harappan site, one a late Harappan site, and a post Harappan site. So here I am showing you what exactly uh, are the findings of the study. The, the one which is Nageshwar here, this one is a classical Harappan period site. And archaeological indicators of ceramic manufacture is there in the form of a kiln and all. Uh, want to ask something? No. Then you have the thin section samples. And also, I did uh, collected uh, several clay samples from there. And also, the ceramics were also subjected to X-ray diffraction. So, in short, what I found was more or less the same kind of uh, compositional variation. And some changes, uh, that is, the percentage of some of the grains become higher. That is, like, for example, mica. Mica shows a payload because mica has a tendency to float when you mix it in water. When you do the process called eutrophication, mica being thin and platy, it will float over the surface and it can be decanted. So very fine ceramics or very fine clay might contain more amount of mica. So that is a minor variation. Other than that, it is just one particular kind of cluster. So it, it just has only one source and that is Bhim Gajat Talao. We analyze the clay from there and we could get that matching plot. Then, this is uh, another site called Vagar, from where it's a small city, small village, but you have ceramics, uh, the material coming from three sources. And uh, we have some indicators of uh, vitrified shirts and all kinds of things, suggesting that there must have been a manufacture. But, that manufacturer, that local manufacturer must have, must have been at a very mini scale, very small scale, and they were getting probably ceramics from outside. It was an agricultural settlement, and they were trying to take care of the agricultural settlements of some major urban center. So it is a hinterland settlement. So all these exercises were done, that uh, provenance determination was done. You need to have uh, geology, understanding of geology and drainage pattern. Then another case study that I did it from, here I am trying, this is the third case, uh, case study that I am showing, which is uh, again provenance analysis, but I am using a different method here. Uh, this is the stratigraphy or the sequencing, and I did some 120 samples from Virana. This is published, this is published in um, Man and Environment, that is one of the journals. And majority of these articles are published, but then it doesn't get very much prominence because it is published in uh, journals and it is very difficult to get it published because they ask me that how many people will read it. <laughs> because the number of readers are very less. So because of that, uh, my articles, but that is another interesting thing, because of that, most of my articles are published from in foreign journals. <laughs> that is, so if you go through this, uh, I have put up uh, some of the articles in, and because of that, I am also not in a position to put up, because after 10 years only, I can upload my articles in internet, because they have this copyright act. 
so which is very strict so you will find some 40 50 articles if you go through the internet actually there is a site freshman space k that is in academia you will get uh, most of these articles i think this one is there because many of those indian publications i put it in my daily but foreign publications if you put it then you will be uh, taken into difficult task because they have this copyright right kind of questions so this is this is published this is there and these are all the ceramics from berana you can see they are all fabric a b c d which tapers and uh, lal you know joshi's classification lal and tapers sorry lal and bb lal and bk tapers are the classification of berana materials and this is the uh, groups and uh, you have group a to j which certain subgroups and you can see that uh, very uh, this has large amount of calcite and like that you have all these things now the real problem begins when you try to look at the mineralogy and also the texture because it comes from if you try to put it that is fine sand medium sand it made uh, some kind of uh, texture analysis like this and three categories i can say that is one is uh, uh, silt and very fine sand then fine sand to medium sand and coarse sand these are the three categories of ceramics that are present there in terms of texture and i will restrict it further because in terms of the samples that were given to me because i do not know how representative are those samples these were given to me by one mr ls rao he is uh, he was a scholar there and when it was coming to provenance analysis i was facing a lot of difficulties because it was coming from this region uh, it does not have any kind of contrasting geological formation and it was very difficult because if you look at it it is old flood plain and terrace then dune and flat here older alluvium and um, like that is the geology so you do not have any kind of contrasting geological formation then some mechanism has to be worked out so you are looking at the sand particles from there so what i did is that uh, try to make some kind of clustering and uh, this way i got it and uh, instead of going for the only for the mineralogy part i also took into account that uh, the susceptibility of this ingredients to weather right yeah, then that will tell you about the depositional history so the depositional history was also taken into consideration for doing the uh, raw material for permanency now this is somebody was asking me about this yesterday about the pigment analysis that uh, composition analysis now what you see here is that s profile jar this is known as s profile jar it has a s profile so you have a red color that is a body part and you have this dark designs and uh, this one stand is another small jar is a different type of jar so you have all these kinds of uh, vessels and uh, their composition always it was thought that manganese is the element that is giving color dark color to this pigment so this was the general belief and i started analyzing i did not get manganese as a major one i was getting iron so i tried different methods i did wet chemical analysis then i did the edx and scanning electron microscopy and while i was doing energy dispersive x-ray analysis that is edx this is how it was coming you have sodium magnesium aluminum silica chlorine potassium calcium manganese pk is very small and i and this one is sample number 9 and uh, this is another sample and this is 12k okay now what is it is that this particular sample is of the body and this is of the uh, pigmented region so here you have uh, iron and manganese is very less then it is it was very difficult something that i did okay i thought because i just put my hand in the pocket where that uh, speaker is <laughs> anyway so i realized that uh, it has something to do with the microstructure also now 
it was not that easy to explain it. So when we added some kind of experiments, I prepared pigments and uh, uh, you know slip using uh, ochre and all kinds of things and mixed it with clay and applied it on the surface of the pots, heated it to high temperature and all, and tried to see how the changes were taking place. Then I also prepared uh, several sets of clay tablets and these clay tablets were heated to different temperatures, that is uh, 300 degree, 350 degree, 400 degree, 450 degree, like that around 10 tablets were prepared and they were taken and they were studied under the scanning electron microscope to see how the microstructure underwent change over it while it was getting heated. So at some point of time, I noticed there is a process called sintering taking place. Sintering is a kind of crystal growth. That is two crystals, they come become one and it becomes a larger. So sintering, that process of sintering takes place. So what you see here is the pigmented area where there is evidence of sintering. And this one is the slip portion where you do not have any kind of evidence of sintering. Now this gave a clue how the two different effects were given by the same element. Now what is happening is that when you look into the compositional part and all those things, this is a little coarse clay and this is a very fine clay. Now they prepared the vessel and they applied the pigment and the vessel was kept for firing. It was heated to a very high temperature, something around uh, 800 degrees, 700, 600, 750, 700, 750, 800 because, and I have uh, determined the temperatures until about 1000 because I have seen moonlight formations which, take, which uh, appear only at that temperature. So this was, while it kept on, you know, you keep on heating it and at the top temperature, you close it to extinguish the fire or to stop the fire. Still, there is some kind of burning going on. And what happens at that time is that, till when you are firing it in an open way, it is ferric oxide that is getting formed. And on the top temperature, when you close it, there is still burning taking place in inadequate supply of oxygen. As a result of which a reducing environment is created, first of ferric oxide gets formed which is dark. The whole port turns dark. Then the cooling cycle begins. Now what is happening is that the pigmented area is the pigment, the colorant is mixed with uh, very fine clay. So there the sintering takes place and it closes all the pores in the top temperature. So the, it, that it is dark, the body is also dark. So while the cooling cycle takes place, the body is extremely porous. This is extremely porous, as a result of which uh, it reacts and again ferric oxide is formed. So that is why you have uh, the same, it looks like, it sounds like a fiction, but I know that, but this is how it happened. We managed to, uh, you know, reproduce it after several experiments, several trials and all those things we got, but not with that pure quality. I won't say that, okay, at least something around 45 to 50 percent I was able to achieve. So you get this uh, two color. So that is why I call it as oxidizing, reducing, reoxidizing cycle of firing. You, 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 somebody asked me this question yesterday, isn't it? Pigment. So these are all the, this I had told you yesterday. Now another one is a glazed research slipper. This is an indicator of a very complex kind of technology. And there is a recently published two articles, uh, have published uh, two articles on this. One, period archaeometry, it was in 2005 or seven, I don't remember. Then another one is that Mark Hanoyer felicitation world limits recently appeared. Then Indian National Science Academy has also published an article which refers to this one. So this is a very interesting kind of, uh, uh, ceramic. Uh, there are only seven shirts from Mohenjo-daro. Makai could find only seven shirts, but its distribution is extremely, uh, it's very popular in the Kutch region. Large amount of the ceramics, you will find it there. 
and but then there has been lot of uh, misconceptions about it especially with regard to the nomenclature because this particular thing is what mckay calls as glaze stress reservoir other than this glaze stress reservoir there are several other kind of pressure reservoirs you have it without having any glaze pressure slipping is a technique of surface treatment what you do is that you apply a slip on that you apply another slip and use a very soft kind of instrument and comb it and remove one part of it so that is pressure slipping so what happens is that a contrasting effect is seen you see the lower slip as well as the upper slip and then there is a sheen on it there is a sheen on it and that made mckay think that it is a glazed one i think two lines about marsh okay sorry about that now so you find its distribution the glazed variety the so called glazed variety you see it in kutch gujarat region whereas other ones you find it in different uh, uh, regional settlements in rajasthan and all and if you look at this history of research splendor leaf the first person to study this he thought that there is some amount of uh, black coat and it is from a powdered slag then uh, makai referred to it as a glaze then dilip chakravarti said that it is due to the accidental fusion of the particles and therefore should not be called as a true glaze he is not a scientist he made this statement it is surprising that when we did an i did analysis on it for several years and i found that uh, his statement is correct that is it <laughs> because he had read about glaze and he knew that glaze is a a chemical term and uh, that i have to appreciate that openly so now i have been doing analysis on this particular material since 1984 i started doing it almost 20 years i had to work on it to get a publication or to present my research because to make it uh, more convincing because i had to do a lot of uh, thin section analysis scanning electron microscopic study then um, energy dispersive x ray analysis x ray diffraction these were the methods that was used and uh, it took almost 3 and a half to 4 years to uh, get this article published because two of us i started doing work then uh, another person joined me then two of us present uh, submitted the article and the expert who was reviewing it he thought that this method is not sufficient you need to have one more method debasher camera method we had to do so both of us did not know how to do it so we had to you know take another expert from that field and it was finally it got published and what we found is that this is it we do not think that it is glazing it is primarily it is cindering the research lecture is cindering and it was fired to above 1000 because moonlight formation is there and hercenite is the coloring material and it was formed control firing and all kinds of things and this is suggesting a very a major advancement in the ceramic technology of the indus valley people because what you have here is that you have a specialist potter specialization is there then you have on the top of it there is a potter who is meant to make exclusive type of materials which is something very interesting because unless the polity is very strong the superstructure is very strong such kind of uh, occupations cannot survive in the society this is a scanning electron microscopic analysis here you have uh, uh, you know the slip. this is a black slip this is a pale slip and this is a body part this is intermittent state of vitrification it's a state somewhere around 900 degrees celsius the temperature has reached there now looking at the provenance of it that was again of interesting here i failed miserably by doing with the but with the thin section analysis it could not be i did not get because i was getting quartz 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 or some feldspar feldspar then started doing chemical analysis so of which this sample is representing a large set of sample only i have five only five amps of it so i took iron oxide and manganese oxide these are all the main 
things that are giving color and this is the chemical composition. Now, when you plot it like this, what you see is that you see some kind of anomaly. Here, this is the black slip, this is a pale slip, and this is the body. Now, what happens is that this is one group that is standing out. Interestingly, like this is this is a particular group that is standing out. That is, this is a, a black field triangle, this is a white field triangle, and this is such a these belong to the same vessel or a same set of vessels, whereas these are falling as different. So here you can see all these are falling. So two different sources, somehow it is happening. Now we were not, uh, uh, we did not know what to do. So it is a very specialized one. And this anomaly suggesting that there is something that is strange happening. So means specialist portal. If you assign the whole thing to a specialist portal, there are more than one specialist portal. Or there are more than, more groups of specialist porters who have been doing these things in different parts of the Harappan world. Now, with that, once this much analysis is done, after 20 years we published it and started continuing. I started working with my collaborator said that, now you do it, I don't want to do it with you. It was very painful for me. So I started my journey alone. And uh, one of my students joined me in between. So we went to Bagastra, that is Dolavira, which has been excavated properly by MS University. And this is the plan of Dolavira. We have a fortification. We have different clusters. You can see that is bead workshop, workshop of Heinz workshop, and then you have shell workshop, and also you have a pottery workshop. And this this site has a lot of resources everywhere. And on the right side, you can see it's photography that is early urban, urban, post-urban, like that, different developments. Yeah. I'll take some more time. It's OK? Ten, 10 minutes. Are you tired? Are you getting bored? No. <laughs> when you are getting bored, please tell me, OK? <laughs> I'll try to finish it. This is. I reduce the slide, 76, maybe around 10, 15 slides, okay? So this is one. And another side, Shikarpur, this is also in Kutch, a entry point to Kutch. So here you have, this is a pattern, what you can see. Uh, this is a fortification and uh, fortified site. And then this is the archaeological sequence, different phases. And uh, again, you have phase one, phase two, phase three and uh, different transfer, you know, transitions in the culture. And when we picked up this black uh, research slip where we got this, these many varieties there, like uh, black and gray, red and white, red and black, brown and cream, purple and cream, different types. So the first one that we did was we tried to look at the water absorption method, uh, determine the apparent porosity using the water absorption method. And uh, we did it for Bagastra and we did, did it for Shikarpur. Then we tried to see it and uh, we noticed that porosity is more or less the same between the sides and color variations. I, then there are certain, you know, uh, different groups having different colors. In their case also, the porosity was coming and porosity is remaining more or less consistent means it is indicative of either one workshop or one technique, which is a popular technique. Being, maybe it may be practiced by two people, who knows. Then we tried to look at the thin section analysis, uh, took samples from uh, Shikarpur, around 250 samples of research paper were analyzed from Shikarpur, Bhagasra and all. Then another 400 samples of associated ceramics. So we are only showing one or two here. And this is published in that uh, Mark and Oyer volume. And this is a, a textural variation and a mineralogical. This is a mineralogical variation, sorry. This is a textural variation. And now we notice that there is not much difference, uh, much difference between the microstructure of uh, research slipware and a specific kind of red door buff wear because that polished type of, you know, that very advanced kind of technique. They were having it more or less the same. So 
uh, clay paste preparation technique remain more or less the same. Uh, but then another thing is that when we try to study these two sites, group A, group B, group C, group D, these were the things. And six set of samples from Bagasra and four sets of samples from Shikarpur fell into group A. And five sets fell into group B from each site. And from Bagasra, nothing was falling into group C, but one set was falling, Shikarpur, one set was falling. And group D, five sets from Bagas uh, Shikarpur fell in and one set from Bagasra. So this is sub something slightly tricky now because there is definitely two centers. I don't know if there can be more centers because when you are looking at it, there are when you each set is something around uh, 10 to 15 samples. Okay, so you, it, we don't think that it does not seem to correlate with site provenance. It is not site provenance, but it's something more than that. Maybe a technology or maybe a kind of uh, uh, additions of material that is being given because the kind of pyrotechnology or many things that may be responsible. So two majority of groups contain samples. Then coarser fabrics are predominantly from Shikarpur. So Shikarpur, that site gives you some kind of uh, uh, experimental stages probably and if you look at group C you have one set of sample that is not and you do not see parallels of that at Bagasra. And uh, when you look at the somebody was asking me yesterday about the distribution of ceramics within the same so intra-site variation within the same region you know you see this reserve slip here in Bagasra, that is uh, concentrated along the southern part of the mound. Uh, does it indicate a separate group of economy or group, a class of people? We do not know. Similarly, in Shikarpur, it appears within and outside the fortification board. But then there is one variety that is appearing outside, out, uh, sorry, within the fortification, while mostly this gray and black variety that appears outside. So there is within this reserve slip itself there is a division, there are groups coming. That is what the kind of conclusion that I can make from there. And uh, if you look at the uh, future prospects of this, we still there are more number of people can work in that one. There is a lot of scope to work in this kind of ceramics. I'm giving you the future prospects of that. Then varieties of paste recipes are there, colorants are there, we need to analyze it. I have the samples and I need to analyze it, then varying body composition has needed to see that any complex formation has taken place due to reactions at uh, higher temperature, microstructural features, then porosity variation, intermittent stages of vitrification, sintering, I would call it as a sintered reserve slip wear rather than a, a glazed reserve slip wear. And also there are certain kind of anomalies. It's a very interesting anomaly because if you look at the third bullet, you see, I consider it as a failed attempt because the consistency, you know, there is apprenticeship also. Maybe people were getting trained in that one. It might sound like a fiction, but then this is how cultural system emerges and it develops and it grows up. Then, I used a very difficult term here, which is not much acceptable to many of the people. I think there was a monopoly of this technology in that settlements and uh, specialist porters and uh, specialist uh, production. I call it as a Rolls Royce model because Rolls Royce is a car which is made to order and it is not made with machine, it is made with human hand. This is what I have read. Paintings and all, everything is done with human hand. So something like that. It's a patented product, you know. And also it's probably it enhanced the economy of that region, Kutch, because Kutch, if you look at the larger number of settlements, even Dolavira, the economy and all those things, probably it is uh, research slip where was going into, and it was giving it what. And then Morbi, it is still a production center of this glazing and all those things. You have a lot of tiles and all those things. So, that, uh, another thing is that the raw material exploitation by the Harappans, it is something very uh, interesting here. So, that is one of the things. And this is probably my last step. Yeah. Uh, Mikesh Radhuar. This is a study which I did sometime in 
uh, uh, this is a really very interesting kind of ceramic that is SR Rao was the first person to notice this kind of ceramics associated with the Indus ceramic within Gujarat. Earlier, while people see the, in, the study of this Indus civilization is a very tricky thing. When India was partitioned in 1947, a great majority of the sites went into Pakistan. And Mortimer Wheeler, who has irritated Indian archaeologists to a great extent and also encouraged Indian archaeologists, he made a speech in 1949 in the Indian Science Congress, a presidential address he gave. In that presidential address, he said, with the, particip with the uh, partition of India, India lost its roots to Pakistan, but its faith is still there in the Ganga Valley. This is what a statement that he made. Then A. Khosh becomes the director general. So he thought that when the uh, partition is done, majority of the settlements are gone, but the same area should be offering some kind of Harappan sites. So he ordered for an intensive exploration along the newly formed uh, frontier states of India, that is Kashmir, Punjab, Haryana was not there, Rajasthan and Gujarat. And in this process, that exploration began. That was a time when Subbaravu wrote Personality of India, where he briefly mentioned that there is a possibility of Harappan sites in Kathiawar region, and it may have uh, identity of Kathiawar. He called it as Kathiawar Harappan. That is a term that he has used. So, a large surveys were carried out, and when three or four potsherds or three or some, some Harappan material was found along with the um, sites, immediately the sites were given a Harappan status. In that process, we missed a lot of regional charcoalific cultures. So this Harappan status, status was assigned to it. Now, that was a time when Rangpur and Lothal were excavated by SR Rao. And he comes out with a ceramics which have which has nothing to do with the Harappan ceramic tradition. That is this Mikesh's reservoir. And this particular ceramic is found uh, in Gujarat. And uh, that uh, this is, uh, you will find it in Pakistan. You have it in UAE. These are all the places that it is found. And uh, this ceramic, there has been a lot of debates about it. If you read, uh, there is a criticism. There is a review by Professor V. N. Mishra in Eastern Anthropologist uh, about the excavation report that was done by S. R. Rabu on Rangpur, Ancient India, Volume 18, 19. It was published in 1963. Professor Mishra's review was published in 1965. And Mishra is blaming S. R. Rabu he is not differing with him much, but he is questioning how reliable is a composite stratigraphy that he is using because he excavated different areas within Rangpur and he was trying to explain the cultural process. So these two need to be read if you want to appreciate the, the skill of this uh, Michael Redwell, the problem of Michael Redwell. And it's a very different type. It's mostly bowls, and interestingly, it has a round base. And round base is not a very easy thing because when you are making it on a wheel, you cut it with a string and mostly it comes flat base and then you will have to, you know, uh, beat it and make it uh, hand making. So multiple techniques need to be used. These are all the properties of it and surface finish is superior and all. Then it also has some kind of paintings and you can see the lines are not straight and it is slightly drooping sometimes. And uh, uh, then uh, these are all the, I have, we have managed to get some 12 forms and uh, the paintings. Uh, then this is uh, the Michael's Redeveur and its associated ceramics. You can see the, this, this one is Michael's Redeveur and they are falling as a separate group. Then if you look at, compare it with the Harappan ceramic, you see some very strange things. Petrographically, that is Michael's Red River. What is the difference between Harappan ceramics and Michael's Red River? Michael's Red River is either handmade or molded. You have undulatory surface, whereas Harappan pottery has very smooth surface. 
and is either wheel made. Yesterday I was saying that there is no pottery is made of one technique. Probably they use more than one technique, multiple techniques you can say. Then regular slip, sometimes unslip, whereas it is burnished. Nike threadware is burnished and it has a glossy slip and it is round bottomed, whereas the other one is not a is mostly flat or different other kinds of things. And the painting execution is different. So there is a lot of uh, industrial quali qualities you can see in the Harappan ceramics. So I call it as industrial style, whereas the Michael Schreddiver is handicraft style. Now, the, the difference between Michael Schreddiver and the associated verse, these are all the differences, that is throwing technique, handicraft and all. Then, but somehow it was overlooked for about 40 to 50 years. Now, if you go through the, I did uh, some work in the India office library in London. Uh, I happened to come across the newspapers of 1958, 59, 60, 61, 62. Small, small newspaper reportings were uh, reports on this. Uh, Renpur and lots of excavations were coming. And those times, the newspaper reports were not uh, spicy and it was more reliable. But then what was interesting in that one, I kept on changing, he kept on changing his position in two or three times. You know, he was, somehow he was convinced that this is entirely a very different kind of uh, ceramic and representing a very different kind of community. And this is the periodization and all those kinds of things. And uh, this is how it looks different. And there are supporting arguments as well as, uh, uh, you know, refuting arguments. Because when you look at the uh, descriptions given by uh, Ravu, in, uh, he speaks about a mud wall. And some, yeah, it's finished, the last one. He speaks about a mud wall, and uh, some archaeologists are of the opinion that it is not a mud wall, it is probably something else, ghost wall and all. Anyway, we have no way of verifying it because it was an excavation that was done in the late 50s, and uh, archaeologists dispute will have to accept it. So, probably it is a different cultural complex that is different from that of the Harappan, and it definitely indicates a regional culture. But does this regional culture has its own independent existence? We really do not know. We need to work on it. Now, uh, for you, this is for you people, uh, there is a lot of scope and prospectus for this ceramic analysis. It can help archaeologists in very different ways. We can understand the organizational aspect of production and distribution. But for that, you need to have a very collaborative kind of work, then we can also, from the data that uh, that are generated from scientific analysis, we can appreciate the social and economic stratification and uh, role of superstructure because in promoting craft specialization. And it also becomes an important component for explaining the urbanism part. Thank you very much, and I will be pleased if you can ask me anything.